Hi everyone, welcome back. Uh, today we're going to be looking at what goes on in the United States during World War I. Okay, we're not going to be looking at any of the fighting, well, we're not even going to look at the, the draft. Uh, we're just going to be looking at the political, social, and economic impact of the war here at home. Uh, I'm hoping to keep this a little short and sweet, uh, but there is kind of a lot to unpack. So here we go. All right. So one of the first things to understand about World War I is it is a progressive war. It's progressive in the fact that it is fought during the progressive era, and you have progressives leading the nation during the war. Okay. Some of those progressives, if you remember back to Theodore Roosevelt, were efficiency progressives. And so their whole goal for the war is to make sure that business and government and production are happening as quickly and efficiently as possible. So for World War I, the government is going to get heavily involved in the business side of the production of those war materials. One of the government agencies that is created is called the War Industries Board. Okay. The War Industries Board is led by a man named Bernard Baruch. I think I'm pronouncing that correctly. That's the way I've always been saying it, so it works for today. But the War Industries Board it basically had two purposes. One was to allocate resources to business. It looked at all the businesses that could were capable of or did produce war materials, and based on their productive capacity, assigned them the necessary resources to produce whatever it was they were producing. Uh, you didn't want a small company being assigned a large number of resources because they may never get through them, uh, where, while a large company may be starving for resources. So they wanted to allocate those resources efficiently, and then they also coordinated the production of the actual war materials. Now, the example I've always used in class with my students is it's great if all the gun manufacturers go out and make guns for the war, uh, but somebody has to remember to make bullets. And so that was one of the purposes of uh, the War Industries Board, to ensure that the appropriate materials are produced and produced in the appropriate and required numbers uh, for the soldiers on the front lines. Another government agency, probably the most successful government agency during World War I, is called the Food Administration. The Food Administration was led by this guy, Herbert Hoover. Remember his name, you're going to see it over the next uh, couple of units. Uh, as he, This was his first government appointment. Uh, you'll see him again, over and over again. The main goal of the Food Administration was to increase food production in the United States. There is kind of a mis misnomer among a lot of my students. They, uh, they think that the, the war started and we need to increase food because all of a sudden we have all these soldiers that we need to feed. And I always try to remind them, we're already feeding those soldiers. They're, they're just not soldiers yet. The reason we needed to increase food production was to feed our allies, Britain, France, Belgium, as we liberate Belgium, they, in 1917, they are getting sick and tired of the war. The people in those countries are starving. They, farmland has been wiped out in France by the war. The uh, men who did the production of food were dying in the trenches. And so there was a feeling that if we didn't feed them, they may drop out of the war. So to increase the available supply of food for the Allies, uh, one of the things that the Food Administration did was they encouraged Americans to ration. They wanted this to be voluntary. Okay? When, when the United States joins World War I, you have to remember the majority of the American people had not supported this idea uh, until very recently. And it was believed that if they required the American public to ration, uh, that they would turn against the war. Okay, you want to turn people in America against something, tell them they have to go without what they want. So this was a voluntary effort. 
And so they, they came up with this, these ideas of you know, saving wheat with Wheatless Mondays, Meatless Tuesdays, Porkless Thursdays. Uh, they did this in an effort to extend the shelf life of some of the, the staples that they could then, since we, the people, aren't having to go out and you know buy as much bread, anything that was left over could be sent over to the Allies. They're also going to encourage people to plant their own victory gardens. This was anything you could grow at home. You know, even if you lived in an apartment, you, know, you could go out and, and buy one tomato plant. Anything you could grow yourself, that's one less you had to get from the market, that's one less the market had to get from the farmer, and that's one more that the farmer could turn over to the government to send over to the Allies. Finally, they also encouraged farmers to buy more land for agricultural production. Now, the United States gets into World War I in 1917. We will be done with World War I in 1918, and Europe will, the agricultural sector will recover pretty quickly. Farmers, not knowing what the future had in store, uh, went out and bought that land and bought new equipment and increased their productive capacity. But they did it, one of the ways they did it was by taking out loans that are going to have to be repaid in the coming years. Remember that for future reference. A couple more government agencies. One of them was the Railroad Administration. Uh, the government took over the nation's railroads uh, for this period of World War I. The idea was that the government uh, could better coordinate the shipment and movement of men and material around the country rather than relying on competing railroad interests uh, who might uh, hold things up. And then uh, the last government agency we're going to look at right here is the War Labor Board. The War Labor Board uh, was headed by, had co-heads, a guy named Frank Walsh and William Howard Taft, the former president. President Wilson, a Democrat, appoints Taft, a Republican, to be on this War Labor Board. Because remember, these men were both progressives, and they both felt that they could you know, do something progressive. So, the purpose of the War Labor Board. If you are a labor union in the United States during World War I, World War I is an opportunity for you to demand compensation, better conditions, whatever, from your employer. If they don't give it to you, you can threaten to go on strike because a strike will disrupt, possibly, the war effort. So the purpose of the War Labor Board was to make sure that those strikes didn't happen. In fact, under the War Labor Board, if a union voted to go on strike, it was automatically tabled. Okay? The strike is automatically tabled. We voted to go on strike, everybody go back to work tomorrow. Because what would happen is those disputes between labor and business would be referred directly to the War Labor Board, who is then going to turn around and negotiate a settlement between the business and the union. And so... While you might look at this and say, well, well, that's that doesn't that's not really fair for the union, you know, you're taking away their ability to go on strike. Yes, but you're automatically sending it to a negotiation. So the union is gonna get something because the goal here is to make sure everybody's working. This War Labor Board was actually endorsed uh, by the American Federation of Labor. Like they they support so you know, multiple unions supported the idea of this thing because I want a 10% wage increase. I'm going to demand 20, vote to go on strike, and when the government says, hey, would you settle for 10, I'm going to say absolutely. Now, what are the benefits of the war? You know, we don't think of war having many benefits, uh, but here at home there are economic benefits that we do need to be aware of. The, probably the biggest thing is the increase in manufacturing employment. We have more people working in manufacturing. Uh, part of that is because uh, the businesses during the war are going to expand. They were already starting to expand uh, after 1914 when Europe got into the war. They don't just start expanding in 1917. They start expanding before then. And so business expansion equals more jobs. 
The other thing that goes down is once we declare war, you're going to have a lot of these men in the factories who quit so that they can volunteer for the army or then later on will be drafted. And so they're, those jobs are vacant, meaning more people have the ability to go and get those jobs and get work. This increased employment, business expansion, uh, is going to be some that's a contributing factor to something called the Great Migration. The Great Migration is the movement of tens of thousands of African Americans from the American South to the North looking for those available jobs. If you've done anything with migration uh, in the past, you'll know that there are push factors that are pushing you out of some place. Well, for African Americans in the American South, it was segregation. And then there are pull factors that pull people to a specific location. And in this case, it was those available jobs. African Americans uh, hadn't moved out of the South in large numbers. Uh, prior to this, there was the Exodusters uh, after the Civil War, but they hadn't really moved to the North just yet because they were in poverty. And one thing you have to have in order to be able to move is you have to have money or the promise of money. If I can just get to the North, I can get a job, and there are plenty of jobs available. And so uh, this is the impetus for tens of thousands of African Americans to move up to the North, and they will change uh, the demographics of many Northern cities, which, again, we'll talk about in uh, coming unit. Another thing that's going to be a benefit for a specific demographic group is the employment of women. When... World War I starts and all these men volunteer or are drafted to go into the army. Um, they leave a large number of jobs and, and there just aren't enough men to fill those jobs. So the call goes out for women uh, to step into vocational roles that we typically wouldn't think of, of women doing. Um, but they always do, especially during uh, our American wars. There'll be the building of bombs, the building of, you see the graphic here of the woman holding the biplane, you know. So women made planes during World War I as well, the bullets, guns. Now, the flip side of this, you know, the government encourages women, hey, go out and get a job, help us out, you know, for the war effort. When World War I ends, uh, the government is going to make a big push. Okay, you did your patriotic duty to take a job. Now they want women to do their patriotic duty and leave that job for the returning soldiers. And in World War I, the government is going to do such a good job with that promotion that more women actually quit their jobs at the end of World War I then got new jobs during World War I because the, it was your patriotic duty to take a job during the war, and now it's your patriotic duty to let a man have that job back. Partly because of the War Labor Board and because they are getting benefits for workers, union membership increases during World War I. Uh, that's a huge deal for, for unions. You know, unions... The, the employees pay union dues, uh, the members pay union dues uh, into the union, and you need union dues to build up your war chest. Your war chest is the money that your union has that they're going to pay to the workers if we have to go on strike. And so if we have a big war, if we have a large number of people, we can have a big war chest, and after the war, we might need to go on strike. Another big economic benefit of World War I that may not seem like a big deal right now, the average daily wage for the average worker increased by $1 a day. Now, to us in 2023, this doesn't seem like a whole lot. It went up by a whole dollar. Well, if you were making $2 a day, uh, that, that's a 50% wage increase. That's, that's a big deal uh, in 1917, 1918. Again, this is also going to be a significant little, seems like a throwaway line here, but it'll be significant uh, later on in our course when we're talking about things going on in the 1920s and the 1930s. Now, these are all 
good things. We've got the government doing you know what it can to make things more efficient. We also have the government uh, abusing its power during World War One. So how did it do that? Well, it created a couple of different government agencies here. Uh, one is called the Committee on Public Information. Uh, the government is going to control what we know about the war. Uh, this bothers me uh, when I hear the idea that the government is controlling the information I get. Sometimes this is called the Creel Committee because it was headed by George Creel. So if you see that, uh, this is what you need to be aware of. Its main purpose was to sell the war to the American people. You know, how do you convince people that it's good for us to send our soldiers over there, uh, especially when you know they hear about mustard gas, they hear about the machine guns, they you know people write letters home about you know I had my my friend and all of a sudden you know a sh bomb hit and my friend was reduced to nothing but his shoes. How do you keep people invested in that? Well, you sell the war to them. You tell them, look, we're, we're doing a great thing here. Okay? They created all these posters. There's the famous Uncle Sam poster. Uh, they recruitment posters. You know, step into your place. You know, get get out here. Uh, I just realized this is a British propaganda poster. Whatever, it works. Okay. They also help encourage the rationing, the conservation. A lot of the posters that we've seen, they were put together by the Committee on Public Information. Uh, as we've seen those going through here, if you can see the background, and then there'll be a couple others in the presentation as well. They also, though, uh, get a little overzealous at times. Uh, there will be an anti-German campaign. Uh, there was a big deal to, to just rename anything that sounded German. So uh, there's a specific food out there called sauerkraut. Uh, it's a pickled cabbage uh, that was popular among Germans, it's, but uh, there's a move to, to rename it during the war, and they call it Liberty Cabbage. And that way you don't have to sound German. Uh, this anti-German campaign goes a little overboard. Uh, it leads some people uh, to assault uh, German Americans simply because uh, their name sounds German, uh, there's cases of families who they changed their last name because they, they didn't want it to sound German, they, uh, whether it was out of fear or out of patriotism. Uh, but whatever, this, this anti-German campaign did lead uh, to people being uh, hurt and in some cases killed uh, just because they seemed too German. Another way the government abused its power was by passing some laws that if you look at them, uh, they... They wander that fine line between what is what is constitutional and what is unconstitutional. Uh, the first one here is the Espionage Act. Uh, espionage means spying. But in this case, one of the things that the Espionage Act did was it forbid the obstruction of military recruitment. So this includes speaking out against the draft. Okay. During World War I, we would have to draft soldiers. Uh, I will tell my students more about this later. But if the government says they want to draft people, and I go out and say, I don't want you to register for the draft, that was a violation of the Espionage Act. And many people are going to be arrested for speaking out against the draft. One of them uh, is going to go all the way to the Supreme Court challenging this. Okay, Schenck versus U.S. goes all the way to the Supreme Court. Uh, Mr. Schenck had urged people not to register for the draft. He pointed to the 13th Amendment, which said that involuntary servitude uh, shall not exist in the United States. And the draft was involuntary servitude to the military. It got all the way up to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court ruled in Schenck versus U.S. that there are limits to freedom of speech that the government is allowed to restrict speech that represents, and this is a quote from the decision, a clear and present danger. And so the argument that the prosecution made was that Mr. Schenck's uh, attempt to keep people from registering the, for the draft was an attempt to keep the United States from building up a necessary military for the war, and then that was a danger to the war effort and to the United States. 
And so Schenck goes to jail, and Schenck is going to serve his sentence because the Supreme Court says that this idea of that there being limits to free speech is okay. In the actual uh, decision, in the actual opinion of the court, it says you cannot yell fire in a crowded theater. If your speech puts someone in danger, that is not freedom of speech anymore. The second law that the government passes is called the Sedition Act. If you remember back early in U.S. history, during the Adams administration, there was another Sedition Act. Well, it's the same basic principle. It's illegal to criticize the government. In this case, it's also illegal to criticize military policy as it relates to the war effort. Again, many people are going to speak out against the law and against uh, the government military policy. One of them was Eugene V. Debs, uh, everybody's favorite socialist footnote. He's going to speak out against it. He's going to be arrested as well. He's sentenced to 10 years in prison. Again, this law is also upheld by the Supreme Court in the case Abrams v. U.S., saying that this was done out of uh, military wartime necessity. And it's okay for the government to restrict uh, our freedom of speech when the government deems it necessary. Now, you can feel how you want to feel. Uh, I'm pretty shaky on this. And I understand at least the clear and present danger rule. I understand that you can't yell fire in a crowded theater. This one's a little harder for me to get behind. Now, lastly, how did the government pay for the war? Governments generally don't budget for wars. And so all of a sudden, the United States finds itself in a war. Uh, we have to pay soldiers. We have to buy equipment. Uh, we need money. Where are we going to get that money? Well, one place the government went for the money was uh, for something called through something called victory bonds or liberty bonds. They sold both of them. It doesn't really matter what the name is. It's the same thing. Uh, essentially, what we, the people, are doing when we buy a victory bond or a liberty bond is we are loaning money to the government. If you know how a savings bond works, uh, you get a $50 savings bond. You go in, you pay $25. That $25 goes to the government. The government gives you a bond, a piece of paper that has a $50 on it. After so many years, in the case of the Victory Bond, the Liberty Bond, when we win the war, after a couple of years, the government will pay you the face value of what they have agreed. That bond that you had, uh, all of a sudden the government will pay you that money. If you don't cash it in right when it comes due, it does continue to earn interest. Okay. Um, so they do the Liberty Bonds and the Victory Bonds. That's still not enough. And so government is going to go out and government is going to raise taxes. If you remember back to the Progressive Era, the government had already passed the 16th Amendment, which allowed uh, for the creation of the income tax, and it is World War I, just a couple of years after the 16th Amendment has passed, where the income tax becomes the chief source of revenue for the U.S. government. Stupid progressives. Now, it's not that much if you're making $1,000. It's only 4% of your annual income. 4% of 1000 it's 40. That's not too bad. It's a graduated income tax, though. So the percentage goes up as your income goes up. And so for World War I, uh, they do that 4% on incomes of $1,000, and then it goes up from there. Uh, the top end, the top part of the tax bracket, uh, was 75%. Now remember, this is going to be your J.P. Morgans, your J.D. Rockefellers, those guys, the ones that are making millions upon millions of dollars, while the rest of us are making somewhere right around the idea of, of $1,000 a year. And remember, that's, that's decent money back then. They're also going to pass something called an excess profits tax. Uh, this, this one bothers me because you've got the government, the government decides what is excess. Well, what if government decides excess is more than what I think is excess? Uh, but they passed that excess profits tax. Again, it's graduated, so so the, the more excess profit you had, uh, the higher percentage you could pay, up to 60% of those excess profits. Uh, 
the way the ex, the excess profits tax works, not to get too lost in the weeds, but if you make profit, you pay a percentage on that. If you make above a certain amount, you pay an additional percentage on the above. Not on the whole thing, just on the above. They're also going to create something called the inheritance tax. I also have a problem with this one. Uh, the inheritance tax is uh, anything that you inherit, the government is going to get its cut out of it. Uh, the inheritance tax pa passed during World War I was 25%. Uh, the inheritance taxes are still around nowadays, uh, and just FYI, the idea behind the inheritance tax was we're going to soak the rich people because J.D. Rockefeller, you know, his children can afford to pay 25% whatever they get from him. Um, the way it works, y'all know the tax code is incredibly long and complicated and convoluted, and there's all kinds of loopholes. And if you're very wealthy, you pay somebody to find all the loopholes so that you can avoid paying these taxes. The people that are getting soaked nowadays by the inheritance tax are farmers because they value their property and their equipment. And if it's in excess of a couple million dollars, which nowadays with property values going up, it's real easy to get there, their kids get hit with the inheritance tax penalty which they can't pay because they're farmers. And so they have to auction off the property to pay the taxes. Right. But again, World War I, government does its thing. Right? And remember, there's only two things that are guaranteed in life. Death and taxes. And that's all I got for the home front. I hope it wasn't too long and I hope you learned a little bit of something. Make sure uh, you go back over that because like I said, you know, there's a lot to unpack in there. Y'all have a great day.